I'm going to give you a 10 minute or 11 minute summary of what the climate science tells us. Not easy to summarize a couple of dozens of years of research in 10 minutes, but I'm going to give it a go. So first of all, the war climate is warming. That's unequivocal. I hope we all accept that basic fact. It's based on observations by organizations around the world. It's also based on satellites. You can measure the warming of the temperature in the deep ocean, in the ice sheets, in the atmosphere, in fact, anywhere you choose to look. In fact, the warming of the climate system is now uh, both unequivocal and many of the changes we've observed are unprecedented. Global air temperature has increased by around 0.89 degrees since the start of the 20th century and the warming trend is shown in that picture there. So the planet is getting warmer. It's getting warmer just about everywhere. Those of you with good sharp eyes will see a little blob of blue over the Gulf Stream of the North Atlantic. That's to do with the global ocean circulation response. It's not a good news story. It doesn't always rain and it isn't always cold in the UK. But if you weaken the Gulf Stream, you can see cooling on a time scale of a decade of something like 10 degrees over Western Europe. And that isn't really a very good thing for us to be thinking about in terms of global security. If you look, uh, the purpley colors there, I always need to remind people, that's not a bit of cooling, that's extra warming. So where you see the purples, that's more warming than where you see the reds. And generally, the trend is now between about 1 and 2 degrees uh, per decade. Uh, sorry, 0.1 or 0.2 degrees per decade. Uh, natural forcing explains a small fraction of that warming. Most of the warming is due to human activity. Over the last... Um, period since about 1950, humans explain somewhere between 100% and about 30% of the warming, depending on the science and depending on how you slice and dice the cake, but it's somewhere between 30% and 100% of our fault. Sea level's going up, even if you read the Australian, <laughs> it's still going up. Global average sea level has risen by almost 0.2 meters over the 20th century. The recent trends are accelerating. Whether they're accelerating because of human activity or by natural uh, variability isn't yet sure. So we're not sure the recent acceleration of sea level trends is due to humans. Uh, that rate of increase is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. The upper trend on that um, diagram the last 30 years is satellites. It isn't because of the sampling of sea level rise by measurements at the surface of the ocean. Those measurements are consistent with what satellites tell us. So the Australian region is, as you may well have heard, particularly susceptible to extreme weather events and climate change. I'm going to touch very briefly on four examples. Infrastructure and resilience, fire, sea level rise, and issues around storm surge and the issues around a beach economy and aging population because I'm getting a bit close for comfort to the end of the distribution that starts to get a little vulnerable to climate change. So infrastructure. Here is the trend in the record hot days per decade in the graph on the left hand side and it's by decade and you can look back to the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and see there has been over a doubling in the number of extremely hot days over what we would have experienced in the 60s. So if people say to you it was hotter back then that's a psychological response in the same psychological responses I have that when I was growing up in the UK, we always had a two-week holiday and it never, ever rained. <laughs> that is a statistical impossibility, but I have no memory of it ever raining when I was young. But it obviously did, and it wasn't hotter back when we were younger. The diagram on the right is a really nice one from Melbourne where the train tracks buckled. That clickety-clack you hear on a train is the expansion slots in the rails to absorb an extremely hot day because the steel expands and it expands to fill the expansion slot. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to know what happens if the expansion slot isn't thick enough, wide enough. And the rails literally buckled. And that was 47 degrees in Melbourne. We are expecting it to be substantially warmer than that in the future. Fire. Top right picture of here was taken from a quarry. 
It was taken from the top of E7B, and it was the fires that would have been probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and that was lighting up the sky as the fires got to the edge of campus. So it isn't something that you would experience out in the Blue Mountains or just in Western Sydney or in rain. It actually got to the edge of this campus. And we are certainly expecting the weather conditions associated with fire to become significantly worse in the future. And if you actually look at the trends in fire weather, they are definitively getting worse. Heat waves kill people. 30,000 people were killed in a heat wave in 2003 in that developing part of the world called Europe. <laughs> Climate change is not merely about the future, and you are not immune from it if you live in a rich Western uh, country. So this summer was hotter than any in the previous 500 years. There was a 10 to 12 degree temperature anomaly. If you think of 47 degrees in Melbourne and add 12 degrees to it, which actually isn't going to happen, so don't stress, but if you add a few degrees on top of 47 degrees, you get prohibitively hot temperatures and it simply kills people. And it's getting worse in Australia. This is a paper from uh, Sarah Perkins and Lisa Alexander in the Journal of Climate. I thought I should put some real science in here. Just, it's very noisy because of variability. Global warming doesn't mean next year has to be hotter than this year, which has to be hotter than last year. It is the overall behavior of the system on longer timescales. And most of us, if we drew a line through that, would show the line grading upwards. Heat waves, this is the frequency of days, but if I look at the intensity of heat waves, the length of heat waves, the spatial distribution of heat waves, they're all deteriorating over the Australian continent, and we know why. So there's two things you can do if you want to know lots more about this. There's a program run by the New South Wales government called NARCLIM, and it's got a website like any good project has. But this one's actually really good because it's underpinned by some of the most innovative modelling that's ever been done and probably the most innovative modelling that's been done for any state in Australia. And it provides you information tailored to New South Wales, and you can go and look up there about at reasonably fine resolution what will happen. It gives you maps like this showing increase in summer rainfall of 10 to 30 percent, decreases in winter rainfall over quite a lot of the um, Sydney Basin, increases in the frequency of days over 35, and a small increase in the risk of fire weather. But these still don't get to the nub of the problem. The nub of the problem are rare extremes occurring by definition infrequently at times you don't want them to occur, often coincidental with other extremes occurring simultaneously. And that's where the cutting edge of the science is now. We're not there yet, but we are beginning to tease out how coincidental extremes break the adaptive capacity of a system. So the good news, because I keep being accused of only giving bad news, so I'm going to give you some good news. And the good news is the amount of warming is up to us not just us, but us as a species. If we cut emissions very deeply, very deeply, ideally starting in about 1990, because that's when we started telling people we needed to cut emissions, we might keep global warming to the picture on the left, where over the continental surfaces, warming is around one and a half to two degrees. If we're a bit stupid, and we don't seriously address the emissions problem at a global scale, we go to the picture on the right. And that shows continental warming in the mean of 5 to 7 degrees. Even that, on top of 47 degrees in Melbourne, is prohibitive. But we exp expect the extremes to warm by more than the averages. The bad news is, I think, snowball and hell are the words I would use in the context of whether we will limit warming to two degrees. I think there's good evidence now that it's basically technically impossible. Emissions at the current trajectory are pointing us to warming of between three and five degrees, and I lack the confidence that that will be solved in Paris. But I would be very happy to be proven wrong. To make the two degree limit now means 3% per year not per decade, 3% per year cut, 
and neg negative emissions from 2050. No one actually knows how to do negative emissions. We're currently emitting 10 billion tonnes of CO2 per year, and sometime in the next um, sort of 30 years, we're going to turn that 10 billion tonnes of emission to negative emissions where there's none being emitted and we're sucking it out of the atmosphere. Seems to me to be a courageous hope for the future. And so, I think the strategy that we need to be employing is a significant investment in building resilience, understanding our vulnerability, and planning for significant climate change as one of the key messages that come out of climate science over the last 10 years. If you want to know more, you can go to the NARCLIM, and, sorry, the New South Wales website, climatechange.environment.newsouthwales.gov.au. They've really got to get that shorter, um, where there's a hell of a lot of really useful information. Or, nearer to home, Risk Frontiers, which was mentioned earlier, is a research centre which is the best centre in the country at understanding risk associated with natural hazards and natural perils. It's not very far from here. It's at Macquarie, and you're very lucky to have them. Thank you.